John Norman Collins was in our sight, okay? Now, when we got to the scene and we had, I was on every scene, every, every body. These were brutal. The girls, all the women had long dangly earrings, and I'll get back to that a little while later. What's all dangly earrings? Uh, the girls were, their breasts were mutilated. They were slashed, and there was always some kind of an instrument or a twig that was shoved up in her vagina. Okay, so this is kind of a brutal, and they were always naked, and this is kind of a brutal type of slaying we had. So. Being a young sheriff, and I got detectives and so on, we we're at the scene, I says, I want the Michigan State Police Crime Lab here. I want the best I can get. So we, we called the crime lab right away. I want them in here. And uh, I'd called the FBI if I had them. You know, I, I, I just wanted, we wanted some professional help. And uh, on every single scene we went to, and it was always after it seemed like it rained the night before. So remember that, Bill? It was always, always after it rained. It was so, the evidence, there was not much evidence there. Took pictures of all these girls, every single one of them. There were seven in total, all of them. And uh, during the investigation, like I said, this went on for two years. And every time it rained, I said, well, we called, we set up a plan called Babysitter. We, got, we put on more patrol cars, more cars that were out, more as many cars as we had, we had volunteers going out and just searching for anything. Naturally, we could never come up with anything. Then our last victim that we found on Huron River Drive, Bill Delahay and I got together and I says, Bill, let's keep this away from the press. This Bill knew about it. He was the only one we could ever trust was sitting on a story. And I said, this body was here. I said, let's keep that under wraps. Let's go back to the old theory that the criminal always comes back to the scene of the crime. Some reason that has always been a theory. He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to stake it out. The area is flooded with mosquitoes. Oh, my God, those poor, we gave the deputies shields and everything else. And I know they were, this is like 1, 2 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we had patrol cars out, we had deputies out, we had the thing pretty well sealed off. So if he did come back there, uh, we had been able to trap him, and hopefully that was going to happen. Well, consequently, I think my men got just a little bit tired of getting bitten by mosquitoes. I, I really do believe that, because someone said, there's somebody down by that body. We took a mannequin and put it down where the body was. You no, know, they got it from Pennies. Pennies, yep, J.C. Pennies. This guy got a better memory than I, yeah. I do. <laughs> J.C. Penny, put that mannequin down there. So when they hollered, someone's there. Well, everybody just swooped on it. Well, of course, nothing. Well, the Detroit Free Press got a hold of that, and right away, Keystone Cops. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah, we were called everything in the mess. Right after that, Milliken got into it. Oh, yeah. uh, Milliken says uh, he's turning this matter over under his authority to the Michigan State Police. At that time, it was uh, Colonel Fred Davids, friend of mine, just a great guy. And he called me up and he said, now, Doug, I don't want you to get upset. He said, but the governor has asked me to take over. I said, Fred, we've already had your guys here anyway. I said, any kind of help you can give me, come on. He said, well, you're not upset. I said, not in the least. Come on down. Let's, so we formed a task force. And, and uh, so many of my men, so many Ypsilanti, so many of Ann Arbor Police Department, we had a big task force in the files, and the, the tips that were coming in were just uh, enormous, believe me. Then, a Walt Krasny, on the scene on the, here in River Drive, called a friend, or not a friend, but some of the people in Ann Arbor decided to pitch in and bring Peter Herkos, the psychic, to Ann Arbor. Flew him here from California. Now. Mr. Peter Herkos was also in on the Boston Strangler. He was called in the Boston Strangler. And uh, of course you know the story about that one. But anyway, when Peter Herkos come, he was there, I was there. State police were on the scene. And Krasny drives up and he says, Doug, he says, I got Peter Herkos here who's a, who's a, uh, a psychic. And we want to let him go down and look at the body. I said, he is not going nowhere near that body until State police are done. Okay, all right, all right. So I thought, well, I'm going to watch this show. So after the state police left, 
Mr. Herkles goes down there, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Got on his knees where the body was and put his hand in it, like he's meditating. And I thought, oh brother, that's it for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Well, he gave a press release that night at the Holiday Inn. I did not go. I wanted no part of Peter Urkels. And in that press release, he said, you are going to find a homemade ladder. Big clue. You're going to arrest an individual who will have foreign money on his possession. He was not born in this country, and he is a young man. Boy, that's a heck of a lot of clues. You know, I thought, boy, we'll be able to solve this in no time at all. You know. <laughs> When we, when Like, who was a state trooper, uh, John Norman Collins was his nephew. He was watching his house for him while he was on vacation. So when Corporal Like, the Michigan State Police, came home, he went down in his basement and he says, there's some red spots on my floor that weren't there. Crime lab come, they were blood spots, okay? Next to the wall in Like's basement was a homemade ladder homemade ladder, which Peter Herkel said he's seen. When we arrested John Norman Collins, he was born in Canada. He had four Canadian dollars on his wallet. That was eerie. <laughs> that, that, that was very, very eerie. Well, I went up to see Dr. Gould, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he was at the Mercywood Hospital. And I said, Dr. Gould, I says, you know, uh, we got a problem on our hands, and what kind of an individual can I be? Can you give me some help? And he's sitting there saying, well, again, you know, it's a young man, but he's, he seems to have a, probably a mother complex. For some reason, he hates the females. And by the way, the females on, 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 that were all uh, brutally murdered were all in their menstrual period, every single one of them. And so when that seemed funny to us that he was talking about that because when his mother came to the trial, she was a knockout. I mean, man, long dangly earrings, remember? The short mini skirt with the boots, remember when they wore them in the oh, yeah. 60s? And I mean, she was, she was a beautiful woman. I mean, boy, oh boy. Then he brought his sister in with her. Whew, another knockout. After investigations, we found out that his mother was a prostitute. And John supposedly had caught her uh, with a man or something. So this is where uh, this turmoil supposedly came up. And a real funny thing happened because once we got, got the trial going, and uh, I don't know if you remember uh, Ryan, Dick Ryan, who was the, you remember him, was the attorney, Smokey Ryan. And he was assigned to the, or not assigned, but he was hired by the family to defend John Norman Collins. So... Right after he became the attorney, he arranged for a polygraph test over in the courthouse, across the street from the jail. So Stan Burdine and I escorted him over, going to go to this, going to go to the, uh, <laughs> going to the polygraph test. That night it was raining, drizzle rain, and as we're escorting John, he's all upset. He's shaking and he's crying. He's really, really nervous. And Stan says. See, mod? I says, yeah, it really does. We got him in lockup now, okay? We're charging him with a crime. So we get him over to the area where we're going to have the office where the state police were there and everybody was there, well secured. And Dick Ryan says, before the polygraph, I want to talk to my client. Dick Ryan took him into Judge Brakey's office. And Dick Ryan talked to him for about maybe an hour. And he come out with his client and he says, take him back to the jail. Polygraph is canceled. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what the heck happened. He told Dick what happened without question. Now, Dick Ryan and I were good friends. I mean, you know, and I'm going to tell you something. And uh, Dick loved his booze, you know. So we get out after this happened. We get out drinking one night. Dick, I said, you can tell me. Tell you what. I said, what did that punk say to you? That was my client, Doug. He said, no, I can't. And to this day, he never, of course, he's dead now, but never said, a, he would not, re, I don't care how drunk you got him. He would not, <laughs> he would not say nothing. But I, like I say, we all knew that happened because the next day, Dick Ryan was fired. Okay? That's when Louis L. and Mr. Fink, Mr. Fink came over. 
And it was, as the trial went on, I'm, I'm doing a lot of skipping around here because we don't have, I know I'm timed, so I, uh, uh, remember the old town club used to be? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Well, we were in there eating, and here was uh, Louis Sal and Fink. And the trial had been going on like this. And Louis Sal said to Fink, I think you blew this case. And if you have, if he's guilty, you find another firm. You know, that was, that was a quote, that was, you find another firm. He says, I think you blew it. He really did blow it. Wow. He did, he did. A lot of circumstantial evidence that we had that, uh, that he... Uh, there was no DNA back then, right? No, no DNA. That, no. That we didn't even have, you know, this had, we had the motorcycle. We had an eyewitness who had the one girl on there. But as far as anything going in, it was real significant evidence. California had a better case on him than we did. John Norman, yes ma'am. Whose blood was on the floor in John Norman's uh, That was never determined. It was just blood that we couldn't type O. Okay, you know. Now, you know, very strange because we had a girl uh, that we picked up and somehow got, she says, I went out with John Norman. And just telling our detectives and she said, I went out with him. She said it was very strange because the night we were out, he was such a gentleman. However, when we got to the door, he said, do you have to go in now? This is her quoting. And she says, well, yeah, I got it, John. I got to study tomorrow morning. He says, well, no, let's just, let's just go for a little ride. He says, you know, before. And she says, no, John, I don't want to do it. And he says, you're in your menstrual period, aren't you? And she says, well, how do you know? He said, because I can smell it. Uh, this kid was weird. Yeah, just yeah. a very, very, very weird very weird individual. The DNA with this, there was no such a thing. Right. So and of blood, course, so the blood really was circumstantial. Yeah. So again, blood was there, but whose blood? You know, here's a typo, here's a typo, and I say the homemade ladder and that type of thing. But anyway, uh, I was again a little bit on the DNA three months ago, three or four months ago. I don't know if you know this, Billy. I was called by the Michigan State Police. Meet us at the Ypsilanti Post, two detectives. So I said, Jesus, I said, I haven't done anything. or what they want me for, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> not that they can catch me for it, anyway. Yeah, right. So I went over there, and I went back into the detective's office, and here were these old files against the wall. And I says, hey, those look familiar. And they said, they are through, they're yours. No. I says, what? These were all John Norman Collins files. He said, Doug, believe it or not, we had taken the panties, the, the uh, nylons, uh, from Dawn Basin. Not Dawn, one of the other girls. I can't remember their names. I'm sorry. Yeah. Been too long ago. Bynum. Bynum. Yeah. Bynum. And we sent it in for a DNA. I says, you're kidding. After 30 years? He says, yes. And guess what? DNA came back, John Norman Collins. Oh. I said, oh, oh. I said, why are you guys working on this thing 30 years later? Well, we want to, you know, in case he tries to come up for proof. I said, 30 years? Come on, you know. It just want to, they want to close the case out. It's a cold case, and you've heard about them, I'm sure. And I said, now we're going to take the, but they went up and talked to John up in state prison. John's conwise, oh. you know, he's not. So he's not going to talk to the officers, and I said, well, you know, you can't blame him. But then all of a sudden they said, well, look, John, all we want to know is, did you know, did you know this girl? Yeah. Had you been out with her? Yeah. Okay, what happened? Nothing. We just went and talked, and I took her on a motorcycle ride and so on. The DNA was on the outside of her pantyhose. A good attorney said, well, hey, her hand, his hand could have touched her leg. You know, that's not enough. So the other girl, the young girl, the, boy, the Basin girl, they got her panties because there's semen in there. So they're sending that in. I haven't found out what happened yet, but they're they're working on that. So, thirty some years, and we still now get some DNA. So I guess they want to close that thing out and, and just be, uh, uh, you know. And uh, does that alarm you though, that uh, as a taxpayer, that they still waste some money on there? Well, yeah, in a way, yeah. To think that, oh, okay. to think that, you know, after all the, and I'm glad. I mean, it just helps me remember that, yeah, I knew we had the right guy, you know? I mean, all of a sudden our murder stopped. You know, it was that, at that time too, we were putting out broadcasts to the girls, young girls, don't hitchhike, stay, go down Washington Avenue and here they were, you know? The girls are out there just, 
it was just terrifying to say, God Almighty, what is wrong? What is wrong with you kids? And, you know, but uh, it was a terrifying time for all of us, and it, it was very, very, very bad. And uh, then Mr. Ralph Keyes came, and he wrote. He's the one that wrote the French Connection, and he wrote, of course, the Michigan Murders. Okay, and the book is out. On, and every now and then, I get someone to call me up. And, Will you sign it? Will you sign the book? I said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Some of them remember, you know. But Ralph Key spent so much time here, and he had me on the phone for just hours and hours. Now, you got to remember, Ralph Keyes is a fictional writer, okay? And he put a lot of fiction there. However, a lot of it was real, actual facts. He did, I read the book. He did a real good job, except some of the things he quoted me as saying. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't remember saying those. He, I, he made up a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. And, uh, but it was, quite a, it was quite a novel. The book was, was, was pretty good, and I was a pleasure to meet him. How am I doing on time? But uh, uh, in, in, in retrospect, do you, do you think of the fact that maybe you could have solved it earlier? Uh, that, you, know? you know, we did. Listen, like I said, we had... Michigan State Police, we had, every, and every time we would have something that would be a significant thing, we'd send it to the FBI lab. So we did everything that was visibly possible other than catching them at the scene. You've got to understand, when you've got a, 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 a serial killer like we had, you know, striking at un ungodly times, striking at people that we have no idea where they're at, uh, the young girl, the 13-year-old girl, he picked her up in the city of Ypsilanti in front of this beauty shop on the back of his motorcycle. Well, then she was killed. Uh, how do you figure that? You know, it, there, just, there was just so many things. It was frustrating. I, uh, the sketch that he made out, that our, our, our writer made out from, from uh, the beautician was pretty darn good. And I went and took some pictures to her myself. And I said, you know, look in here. She said, there he is. She pointed him out, John Norman. John Norman lived right there at the campus, you know, and so there was just a lot of things that this kid was involved in. But like I say, when they brought him to when they brought him to uh, court, suit and tie and shirt, and that's the days when everybody had the hippies. You know, remember the, the long hairs? And when I got nailed for haircuts, which co cost the county six hundred bucks for that. <laughs> I, I had, and I'm skipping this a little bit, I'm going to be real general if I could, but uh, I, I remember two hippies came into the uh, sheriff's office, and I was in my office, and they came up to the desk, and their long hair and their scraggly, you know, and uh, they want to bond out one of their friends. And I heard them, so I went out the door and I looked, and this one kid had the American flag sewed upside down on his yeah. butt. <coughs> and I come out and I said, arrest him. Throw him in the jail. My sergeant says, what for us? Never mind. Just put him in jail right now. <laughs> kids, I locked him up. The kid's feet never hooked him. Yeah. He's going to bond somebody out. Now he's got to get bonded out. I threw him in jail. So I said, take his pants off and he want them as evidence. Desecrating the flag. So I called Bill Delahaye up, right? Bill and I are good, good friends. Bill, I just told him I did. He says, God, and what statue you got him on? I said, I don't really know, but I said, it's got to be something. I said, you do, you're the lawyer. Figure it out for me. Harvey Law. Yeah, right. And uh, he says, well, that's a creating the flag. He said, we'll, we'll try that out. He said, I think we can ask Mr. Meaner. We can try that out. So we got to hold the judge and says, what do you think about 90 days? And he says, yeah, that sounds good. <coughs> and we worked for the judge. Everything worked kind of together on that. There was about four of them, hippies, that we arrested. And so I had a, uh, didn't have a barber, okay? But I had this young man up there who said, hey, I'm a barber. I know how to cut hair. He said, okay, cut their hair. He did. Their dandruff was higher than their hair, honest to God. I mean, he just took that, <laughs> took that <laughs> and shaved it. And uh, when they found out, we went down to federal court and uh, Tom, who was the attorney with the prosecutor with the crew cut? I can't think of his name. Oh, anyway, he was a prosecutor. And he went down and he had a crew cut. I had a crew cut. Tom Shea. Tom Shea. Tom Shea, Tom Shea had a crew cut. And so we went down to federal court. And uh, this attorney who represented basically a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, all the incel people, you know. And anyway, he says, now, Sheriff, if the good Lord were to be arrested and come to your jail, would you cut his hair? I said, if I suspected he had lice, yes, I would. 
<laughs> but I said, he's not going to do that. But that's the kind of thing they work. But the judge found us guilty and fined them each $600. And they test, these kids got up and testified, and they says, this barber was not a barber. He was a convicted murderer going to Jackson Prison. <laughs> that scared them more. So that's was it what, true? That was true. <laughs> 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 it was right after that the, the, the good county uh, supervisors allowed me to have a licensed barber <laughs> in the jail. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt, but he's talking about Delhay. Delhay was the prosecuting attorney forever. He's dead now. But this guy gave Delhay many gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and I worked together so many times, and just. It was just it's just a real good guy. I had to go on. If you remember John, John and Marilyn Turner, remember? I had to go down to uh, Channel Seven and to go give a to go get a talking to the get an interview. And I'm in the green room where they get you fixed up, you know. And this lady is sitting there, and and she says, "So you're the sheriff?" I said, "No, I was the sheriff." And she says. Well, she says, I'm John Norman Collins' confidant. Ooh. I says, whoa, Ooh. glad to meet you. She said, I'm at Jackson Prison every day talking to him. She says, you got the wrong man. I says, yes, yes, ma'am. I, I, you know, I said, I would figure you would say that. I said, but isn't it strange all of our murders stopped? Maybe the murder moved out of our county. I don't know. But he didn't go anywhere else. You know? And she, yeah. well, she says, I happen to know how nice of a kid he is. I says, oh, yeah, just when they brought him into court, if you would have seen, right, Billy? If you would have seen that kid, haircut, tie, suit, nice young college kid, and you say, geez, oh, man, this is the kind of kid I'd like to have my daughter go out with. Well, Joe, Joe Lewis L., one of his attorneys, used to go in the back of his chair and tell the jury, both hands on oh, the both shoulders. Both hands on the shoulders. This yeah. boy, you wouldn't send this boy to prison. And on and on, <laughs> I started to cry. <laughs> I almost felt sorry <laughs> for him. And they didn't want me on the stand because I had my broken leg, remember? Oh, yeah, you had a wheelchair. Yeah. Boy, Louis Sal was madder in hell. He was mad because I was in the wheelchair yeah. and I had that broken leg because I was in a motorcycle accident. And he says, and his partner says, don't keep him on long. They're going to get too much sympathy for him. <laughs> Neil, Neil Fink. Neil Fink. Look, Fink. Look, I, I met Neil Fink's boy, uh, mother out in the hallway, and I said, you must be very proud of him, Neil. Oh, he's such a nice boy. He was a bastard on that. He was a prosecutor. Uh, no, no, Neil oh, oh, the attorney. Yeah. Louis Sell and Fink. Yeah, were, yeah okay. And, and they were nip and tuck, boy. They were just perfect yeah. for that. I'm standing there, Bill Delahaye's here, Walt Krasny's here, and Fleming comes up. And he says, you know, he says, you're the chief of police and you're the prosecutor. He says, I want this stopped. He says, my students are getting hurt and so on. And they says, well, better talk to him. He's the sheriff and he runs the county. And Fleming says, well, I said, let me tell you something. One more rock, one more brick, anything comes, I said, I'm going to clear that crowd out, and if you're with them, you're going with them. <laughs> but I didn't use them kind of words. <laughs> and Wham had the radio right there. He got bleep, bleep, bleep. You know? Before or after. And right after that, that's when a rock came. That's when, oh. we, that's when we just... Yeah, before or after that, he's in Krasny's office, the police chief's office, uh, and Fleming and him, and I'm outside, and I can hear him because he's got a loud voice. No. He's pointing at Fleming, and he says, you, you're the cause of all this stuff. All your monocalling of your students, we wouldn't be out there getting officers hurt. One for you. I thought, my God, he's talking about president of the University of Michigan. Yeah. Real, real quickly, the other president for Eastern Michigan, just a fabulous individual, yeah. night and day. Yeah. They had a problem down in Eastern Michigan. So he called me down, and I got down there, and he says, they barricaded my building. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, you're the sheriff. That's my building. I want them out. Fleming didn't do that. No, no, no. Harold Kerr, my detective, we're going down because the students are marching all over. So Harold Kerr is in the back seat of my car and I'm driving and he's taking movies because I want to see. A lot of these kids that they took movies of were the ones, the same ones that were at University of Michigan causing all that problem. But there were some times going on at our jail. And if you remember in the 60s, and a lot of you 
some of you remember. In the 60s, we had the Vietnam War protesters. We had the campus riots. We had the Michigan murders. And we had the welfare mothers. And we had the riots. All of that going on in those 60s. Detroit Sheriff calls me up. He's got 400, 300 prisoners in, in the state fairgrounds in, in Detroit. Sheriff, he said, can I bring some prisoners up and put them in your jail? You knew how small Washtenaw County Jail was. I think we only housed, I think, 200 at the, at the most. I said, well, how many do you want to bring up? He said, 100. I said, no, I got 150 in here now. I said, bring me 50. I said, all right. So he brings me 50, and they come up on the bus. Their hands were like this. Armed guards in the front, another guard in the back, and they had us all the way from Detroit, their hands up like this. Got out of their jail, and these, these guys stunk. Oh, I mean, you can imagine. They, they've been in the, in the fairgrounds, sitting on, on, on dry ground, on, on uh, gravel and so on, uh, no cement or anything, and they hadn't taken a shower in three or four days. And so when they got there, I put them in a cell, a big cell, that normally would hold 20 put 50 in there, but I put through some mattresses, sleep on the table, and this gave them toothbrushes, and it says, here, here's the shower, start showering up. Well, they thought they died and went to heaven. One of them did. Next morning, next morning, <laughs> my sergeant comes down to me, and he says, Sheriff, we got a problem. I said, with those prisoners? He says, yeah. I said, damn it. He said, it's not that bad. And I said, what, how bad is it? He said, one's dead. I said, what? How bad, how bad can it be? He said, so I went up there, and he was laying on the picnic table, cold as a mackerel. And I said, oh my gosh, and he happened to be black. Boy, I could see it now, you know, man, oh man. So right away, at, at that time, that's when Wheeler was, uh, I think, uh, the mayor. Al Wheeler. Al Wheeler, and then we got uh, Booker T. Williams, Vanzetti Hamilton. I got all of them, come on in the jail. And I got them in my offices, here's what took place. Now I want you to go up there and interview these prisoners to show that they weren't mistreated or anything. And so they come down, pacified everybody that uh, right. that this happened, so. Where did he die from? Huh? You know what he died from, or? Pneumonia. Died from pneumonia.